ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, let's find our seats. Welcome to night three of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. Okay, let's, let's settle down, everyone. Let's quiet down. I have some notes regarding scheduling to start. Tonight, we will jump ahead to Article 45 with the meeting's permission, the Minuteman High School budget, because we have to schedule the superintendent's visit in advance. Then we will resume where we left off Monday with Article 16. Next Monday, May 6th, will be town budgets night. We will start with Article 39, continue to Article 40 for the capital budget, and then resume wherever we leave off tonight. We schedule that night because we invite all the department heads to answer your questions on various budgets. Next Wednesday, May 8th, will be the opening of the special town meeting with its five articles. The select board is not expected to have its report available for the special town meeting until early next week, perhaps on Tuesday. That gives very little time for you all to review the report, and we're going to do two things to address the compressed time frame. First, the select board voted tonight on Article 5 from the special town meeting warrant to not provide a recommended vote. So priority will pass to the petitioner who's working with a town meeting member to make the main motion under that article, and that is already underway. They, uh, the select board will still have the opportunity to change their decision on any of the articles in the special town meeting warrant until they issue the report officially, but will operate under the assumption that their decision tonight will stand and we can course correct if that changes. Uh, we can course correct the town meeting. So if you have amendments, substitute motions, or materials to share for any articles in the special town meeting warrant, including Article 5, the resolution, contact me in advance. You can find my contact info on the official town meeting page. The second thing we'll do to address the compressed time frame between the issuing of the select board's report and the start of special town meeting uh, is that on when, next Wednesday, immediately following Article 1 of the special town meeting to receive reports of committees, Anyone who feels that there's insufficient time to prepare is free to make a motion to adjourn the special town meeting until the following week and resume, and we'll, at that point, we would resume the annual town meeting if that passes. Uh, so if such a motion is moved and seconded, it will be decided by town meeting whether to continue with art the five articles of the special town meeting on May 8th or take more time to prepare. So power to the people, even if that means a little less predictability. Just a reminder that I sent an announcement to the TMM email list on April 19th that we'll be following the same practice for resolutions as we did at last year's town meeting. That affects Article 5 of the special town meeting warrant and Article 66 of the annual town meeting. There will be one proponent speaking for and one opponent speaking against, plus proponents of any substantial subsidiary motions that I've approved in advance. That means no live speaker queue. Priority will be given to the petitioner of the resolution uh, in selecting the proponent who speaks in favor. And as we mentioned, if the select board's vote tonight stands, uh, then um, a main motion could be made by a town meeting member working with the petitioner of that resolution. Anyone interested in submitting an amendment or substitute motion for special town meeting article five must get those to me for review as soon as possible. If I don't receive your motion before this weekend, it's highly unlikely that it will be approved in time for next, week's, uh, next Wednesday's special town meeting, assuming it doesn't get uh, uh, delayed through adjournment. You can find my contact info again on the uh, official town meeting page. Lastly, seats for the next speaker in the front row have been reserved with pink signage that says reserved for next speaker. That's the, the on-deck circle, but instead of a circle, it's four discontinuous chairs. And so when I call the second speaker, uh, please try to find your way. If you're in the, on the floor of the auditorium, please find your way up to one of those uh, chairs. There's two here and two over there um, uh, so that you're ready to hop up to a podium when it's your turn. And it'll save us some time. And with that, uh, 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 well, well, there's, well, there's no or order here. It's just remarks. But point of order? OK.
I think this is a point of order, at least I hope it is. You have explained how the speaker who speaks, uh, the proponent of a resolution will be selected, but how will the uh, speaker speaking against the resolution be selected? At the moderator's discretion. Thank you. Uh, it hasn't been formalized. It's something that will, I think, be reviewed at some point by the Town Meeting Procedures Committee, but has not been codified. Okay. Yep. We actually haven't had enough speakers in the past to warrant a whole process for it. We'll, we'll see if that changes this time. Thank you. And with that, um, please all rise for the national anthem. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 6th at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a second to Mr. DeCourcy's motion. All those in favor of adjourning to Monday, May 6th at 8 p.m. If we don't finish tonight, we're not gonna finish tonight. All those in favor say yes. All those opposed? It's unanimous. The point of order? Does someone have number 200 handset? Does someone have, please check your handsets to see if you have number 200. If you do, you've probably stolen it from someone else and you can find that person in the back. Okay. We have a winner. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll now take a test vote. I didn't come up with tonight's vote, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we get. Will the Bruins win the Stanley Cup? I think that's hockey. Is that what that is? And it passes, the, 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 the Bruins win the Stanley Cup. Yeah, can, can we show the, uh, the votes? So, thank you. Okay. And as, as we're going through the votes, uh, are there any announcements and resolutions? And if, if we have more than one, you can line up in one of these aisles here. Yeah, we have an announcement here. Yeah. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18, I just I'm going to make an announcement. There'll be a community barn dance at St. John's Episcopal on Pleasant Street on Sunday, May 19th from 3 to 5. Everyone is welcome, all ages, all kinds of people, small, tall, anything in between. Uh, and 
They're hoping that there'll be a band. If you have, know anybody who wants to sit in with the band, there'll be music there as well. Thank you. Great. Right, thank you, Ms. Bloom. And any other, I believe there's a flyer in the back, I think. Is, is there any announcement, any other announcements or resolutions we have on the side here? Uh, Dave Levy, Precinct 18. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, there's a virtual public forum run by the uh, Arlington Conservation Commission that will discuss uh, the future of the athletic fields at Arlington High School. And of course, it's going to have everyone's favorite topic, turf. So if you're a proponent or not, uh, this will be an interesting uh, debate for sure, but you should let your voice be heard either at the forum or in advance. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Levy. Uh, any other announcements or resolutions from the balcony, from the satellite room? Seeing none. Um, are there any reports of committees? Yes, Mr. Revelak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelock, member of the oh, Arlington I'm sorry, one second. Uh, we don't have Article 3 before us yet. I uh, oh, my jumped in. Uh, Ms. Deschler, my mistake. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. OK, we have a second to take Article 3 from the table. All those in favor say yes. Yeah. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Uh, Mr. Revelock. Uh, Steve Revelock, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I move that the Arlington Redevelopment Board's supplemental report to the 2024 annual town meeting be received. This report contains a small change to the board's recommended main motion for Article 28. Okay, we have a second to receive the supplemental report of the Redevelopment Board. All those in favor say yes. Yeah. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Revelock. Are there any other reports? Mr. Schluckman. Paul Schlickman, chair of the Arlington School Committee. I will spare the speech because I have a little letter in here, but I move receipt of the fiscal year 25 Arlington Public Schools School Committee budget and report to town meeting. Okay, we have a second. Uh, all those in favor of uh, receiving uh, Mr. Schlickman's report say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Thank you. Any other reports of committees? Yeah, yeah, uh, Ms. Gruber and Mr. Bagnall. Sure, I'll start. Um, Alex Bagnall, Precinct 10. And do we have some slides? Somewhere. Anyway, Mr. Moderator, I move that the report of the Hybrid Town Meeting Study Committee be received by town meeting. Okay, we have a second. All those in favor of receiving the report of the Hybrid Town Meeting Study Committee say yes. Somewhere there. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, uh, Alex Bagnell, co-chair of the Hybridstown Meeting Study Committee. Uh, we were established per the vote of this body in the spring of 2023 with a charge of reviewing uh, other towns' hybrid town meeting practices and technologies, um, including evaluating uh, the legal landscape, policies, procedural, social, and access issues, and uh, including the uh, impact on community interest and in serving in this body. Uh, we have started our business of evaluating and recommending potential technology approaches and also budgetary impacts. Um, and then as we get into implementation, we will support this implementation as required. Next slide, Next slide please. Uh, we first convened in November of 2023, We've been holding monthly meetings. Uh, to date, we have attended Lexington's hybrid town meeting uh, where they are using our old frenemy, the portal, um, we will continue to follow up with questions, including meeting with Belmont, who are currently engaged in a hybrid town meeting process, um, and attending Burlington and Brookline hybrid town meetings. Uh, we are also evaluating and keeping an eye on the pending legislation that is before the state legislature. Next slide, please. We've also designed several surveys to assess opinions concerns and potential usage of remote town meeting access. Those surveys have gone to four groups, current town meeting members, former town meeting members, and past users of the town meeting remote room. Uh, those surveys have fairly similar questions um, and hopefully uh, most of you have received a link to those surveys as it pertains to you. 
We also have a survey that's going to the community at large. That survey can be found on our webpage on the town's website. Um, regarding the survey for current town meeting members, uh, the link is there, and I believe uh, the town clerk will resend the link tomorrow if uh, you've lost that email somewhere in your inbox. So far, about half of you have responded. I wouldn't say it's a context, but uh, Precinct 16 has about 100% response, and a few other precincts have only a couple or so responses, and I won't name you and embarrass you all. Um, next slide, please. So if it's determined that hybrid is a form of town meeting that we'd like to proceed with, Right now, we don't have a determination of what that time frame might be. Um, it's impacted by several um, criteria, the technology that we can select, uh, budgetary and contractual issues that we may be under, and also changing um, might potentially existing town bylaws. Um, finishing up, if you wanna follow our work, uh, you can go to our page on the town website uh, you're also welcome to attend our hybrid meetings. We meet most um, fourth Mondays of the month. Um, our website has agenda, minutes, and reports. And I also want to call out the work so far of our members besides Alex and myself as co-chairs, Carrie Fallon, Pete Gast, um, Guillermo Hamlin, Steve Storch, and we've been supported really well by Syed Kodir, who's a member of the town's IT department, uh, the town clerk, Julie Brazil, and of course, the town moderator, Greg Christiana. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Any, any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Ms. Deschler? I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, oh, we have a second. Uh, all those in favor of laying Article 3 upon the table, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Uh, the next article in our usual order would be Article 16. Uh, we have scheduled with the Minuteman School Superintendent to present Article 45 tonight, Ms. Deschler. I move that the undisposed articles in the range 16 through 44 inclusive be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a second to lay those articles upon the table. Uh, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Uh, Article 45 is now before us. Okay, uh, Mr. Tosti? Oh, actually, before Mr. Tosti starts, uh, can we just show the speaker queue and clear that uh, so everyone knows that they can um, request to speak under Article 45? Uh, Al Tosti, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to ask for an additional five minutes for a total of 12 minutes uh, to allow the superintendent to make a presentation. Okay, uh, do we have a second to, okay, so for a total of 12 minutes, is that correct, Mr. Mr. Tosti? That is correct. Okay, uh, we have a second. All those in favor of uh, giving a total of 12 minutes speaking time, of five additional minutes, uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Okay, you have 12 minutes. Okay, this year, uh, as a member of the Finance Committee, I was assigned to do the Minuteman budget. It's been a school I've uh, had a long-term interest in. For new members, Arlington has been an original member of Minuteman uh, since the district was created almost 50 years ago and currently represents about a third of the district. The issue of Minuteman has never been about the quality of the education, but the cost. You may remember that last year I handed out a spreadsheet which showed uh, Minuteman's cost versus uh, all the rest of the vocational schools in this state. Uh, the superintendent will respond to any concerns in that issue. Over the last two years, we've had two promises made by superintendents to the finance committee. Superintendent came, promised that the playing fields would, would be covered under their revolving fund, and after the first year, the members would not have to pay a penny. Then the superintendent left. The next year, the superintendent didn't know anything about that, but then promised that any increase in state aid from the governor's proposed budget in January will be used to reduce local aid. 
then that superintendent left. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, the interim superintendent, uh, Mr. Kevin Mahoney, uh, was aware of both and carried both to fruition. And today, all the playing fields are paid for by the reserve uh, revolving funds of the school, and all local aid will be used to re increase local aid will be used to reduce assessments. Finance committee thanks him very much and for the school, and we recommend favorable action on this year's budget. First, very briefly, I just want to introduce Sarah, Sarah Montague, who is the Arlington representative to the Minuteman School Committee. So if you have any complaints at all, you go to her. If you have any compliments, you go to the superintendent. At least that's the way I was explained. So I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Mahoney, the interim superintendent uh, for Minuteman School. Thank you. And um, do, do you have a, 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 Mr. Tosti, do you have a, a request to uh, 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 Superintendent Mahoney to speak? Request permission for Superintendent Mahoney to speak to this body. So we have a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It's unanimous. It's Superintendent Mahoney, and also just I'll pause the timer for just a second. If anyone has clicker number 229, please return that to the back of the hall. It's someone else's. Uh, Superintendent Mahoney? Sorry for the interruption, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tosti. Uh, I'm accompanied tonight um, by the school business manager, Nikki Andrade, uh, who will be uh, with me in case there are questions that we need to work through. Uh, as uh, Mr. Tosti mentioned, my name is Kevin Mahoney. I'm serving as the interim superintendent, and I'll be leaving June 30th. Of, um, of this year, but we, we are anxious and looking forward to welcoming uh, Heidi Driscoll, who will be uh, taking over the position of superintendent director on July 1, and we're all uh, very much looking forward to her and her leadership uh, taking Minuteman into the next chapter. So uh, I just want to, uh, I, I, I want to thank uh, town meeting for the opportunity to offer a few comments on our budget and assessment and uh, we'd like to make sure we answer all questions with the hope of receiving an uh, affirmative action by town meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So our overall operating budget that we're proposing for next, next fiscal year is $31,517,219. Uh, $517, That's about just under 4% over uh, uh, fiscal year 24. Next slide, please. So just breaking down that, when we look at it, just our operating recommendation, that's about uh, $24,160,000, which is slightly under 3% for our operating side. Our capital recommendation is about $1,660,000. That's up uh, significantly in terms of a percent uh, over uh, fiscal 24. But the reason, uh, the, the major reason for that is we've, over the last couple of years, have been setting aside about $500,000 in our capital stabilization fund to make sure that, that we continue to maintain um, the building that was supported by Arlington and the other member uh, towns uh, back about uh, seven or eight years ago. It's been online now five years, uh, which is, um, Time flies from my perspective, and um, you know it's important that we move forward and maintain a, a capital stabilization fund that will be uh, sufficient to meet future needs. Um, so we're, we've uh, jumped that up from 500,000 to 850,000. In addition, we do have a building that we've used for various purposes over the last number of years. We call it the East Building. It's been used as a uh, child care center. It's been used as a private elementary school. Um, and we think there may be opportunities for uh, Minuteman to use it in our daily operations, uh, most notably for our animal science program. We currently have that in temporary space that's not in the main building. Uh, it's a relatively new program being in its third year. And there may be opportunities through some type of a partnership or uh, some type of a uh, uh, enterprise to, to come in and, and collaborate with Minuteman and perhaps invest in that building for um, animal science clinic. Or there may be other opportunities that we're looking at. And um, those, uh, those discussions are ongoing, 
but we want to make sure that uh, Minuteman has the financial resources to be able to do that. I, 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 uh, with those comments, I want to make clear that at this point in the short run, any renovation we do to that uh, building would not necessarily translate into additional seats for in-district students. So, uh, and then on the building project, we're about $5.7 million, 1.36% over fiscal 24. All of our debt is, is issued on the school building project and we would expect that to sort of stabilize moving forward. Next slide, please. As we talk about the assessments, uh, our assessment is about $25.7 million, which is 0.82%. Uh, That's an unusually low assessment number. It's not one I would suggest people get accustomed to. Um, I think there were some anomalies that happened in, in this fiscal year and next fiscal year uh, that has artificially suppressed that number this year. Uh, one of the points that Mr. Tosti made about uh, uh, the school district um, uh, offsetting the, the debt service associated with the uh, athletic fields uh, by using our uh, revenue that we generate through the rental of the, of the facilities was, a, was an impact, uh, a first year impact in this assessment, but now that that's gonna be moving forward, that'll just be continued. Um, but I think in year one, it had a bit of an impact. And I think that what we're gonna see over time, and we'll demonstrate this in a few minutes, um, that uh, out of district students uh, uh, enrollment is reducing, which is a good sign in terms of getting in more in district students involved uh, in opportunities for vocational technical education. But on the other hand, the, the revenue that's paid through that tuition has offset member town assessments and we're gonna see that diminish over time. So uh, when we talk about the assessment to Arlington, it's about $8.6 million. That's a decrease of about $370,000 over fiscal year 24, and a lot of that's based on the enrollment trend. That's the number that we'll be asking for your affirmative action tonight. Next slide, please. Just a sort of a breakdown, high-level breakdown based upon the, uh, the assessment components. Uh, the required minimum contribution is the, the larger number at $3.4 million. Uh, that's generally uh, determined under the uh, school aid chapter 70 formula. And just to point out the building project, that service line, it's second to last line, about uh, $1.8 million. That was uh, exempt from the tax levy through a debt exclusion override that was voted by the town. Next slide, please. Uh, we did uh, meet uh, back in um, early March with the, with the finance committee and it had a very productive and uh, engaged discussion. Some of the uh, drivers of our budget when we look at the salary is uh, our co uh, collective bargaining agreement at three and a half percent plus steps. We did reduce a couple of administrative positions, but we did bring back positions that we had to reduce due to COVID, uh, a couple of aides and a uh, co-op coordinator. We've seen our co-op uh, placement in, uh, rise substantially, which is also very good, a very positive step. We had, uh, because of enrollment, we had to add an unbudgeted uh, foreign language teacher this year. We were able to absorb that within the, the operating budget and we're con continuing that position. And our, um, our uh, student in, uh, activity in, as far as our athletic program is, 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 is really um, incredibly high and we're uh, adding a, an athletic trainer to support, manage that program and comply with our MIAA rules. Uh, a couple of, uh, next slide please, a couple of other drivers is uh, non-salary, is uh, transportation, utilities, we're able to level fund our health insurance because we had a better uh, result this year and we're focusing on cybersecurity. Next slide please. As I mentioned before, we, we've invested in our capital stabilization account, uh, the debt service we talked about with offsetting the fields and we're making a, a, a little bit higher contribution to uh, OCUB. Next slide please. On our overall enrollment, you'll see that uh, the red line, the, the blue line on the top is the overall enrollment. The red line is the uh, in-district enrollment and the green line is the out-of-district enrollment. And as you can see, going back over the last six years, we had about 234 uh, non-member uh, uh, students. It's now 37. So that corresponds with the reduction. Um, in the revenue we anticipate. Next slide, please. 
This is just an enrollment analysis by town. As you can see, uh, Arlington has, two, uh, as of October 1, 215 students. Uh, we're anticipating uh, for next year, we have 45 accepted students coming in, which will, will be a slight uh, a decrease to Arlington. And uh, in our discussions with the Finance Committee, we did provide sort of a three-year forward-looking document. And if we tend to see that enrollment stay at that mid-40s level, we should not anticipate uh, a lot of spikes in, our, um, in our, uh, the Arlington assessment, given those assumptions. Next slide, please. Um, again, these are some of the points that we talked about with the out-of-district tuition going down. Uh, that will have an impact on, us, on assessments. Um, and it's just sort of a forewarning because we're seeing those students that are currently uh, enrolled, um, those numbers are starting to drop over the next couple of years. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments on the cost, uh, the per pupil cost for Minuteman. Uh, we had a discussion again with the Finance Committee and, and other, uh, our other member towns that Minuteman is uh, the highest uh, uh, per pupil cost uh, vocational school in the state. Uh, a lot of the, the uh, factors that are driving that are uh, uh, teacher salaries, um, competitive within our uh, uh, member towns, our, um, our cost of special education. We have 40% 40, uh, 40 of students that receive uh, services. And our transportation costs due to the geographical location of the district, with the school being on the easterly side, uh, our transportation costs are rather expensive. Um, that uh, concludes my uh, comments. We, we, we uh, would ask for your affirmative action on the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Mahoney. And also, I want to apologize to Mr. Tosti and uh, Superintendent Mahoney. Uh, uh, the superintendent was already authorized to speak from the first night of town meeting, uh, and so he's doubly authorized, but that doesn't give him twice the time. <laughs> okay, so we'll now turn over to the speaker queue, and we'll start out again with two speakers. Uh, uh, announced at a time. First, uh, Mr. Benson and then Mr. Rudiman. Mr. Rudiman, if you could find the seat with the pink signs, we'll call them the hot seats maybe. We'll see if that works. Um, Mr. Benson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. You know, when Arlington looks at itself, we compare ourselves to a mix of other communities in many ways to see how we're doing. In this instance, I thought it would be interesting to compare how Minuteman is doing financially to the nearest Votech to it, Shoshin Valley Tech. Here's what I found uh, comparing the budget we've seen tonight to Shoshin Valley Tech's budget. The cost per pupil for our town in this budget is $39,824 per year. The cost per pupil for Billerica, which is the largest contributor to Shoshin Valley Tech, is $23,700 per year. That's a difference of $16,124 per pupil per year. Arlington has 215 pupils at Minuteman Tech. Uh, multiply that to the difference and you get an additional amount that Arlington's paying compared to what Bill Ricker's paying per student of $3,466,660 per year. So it's not only the most expensive Votech school, it's by far much more expensive than Shoshin Valley, a nearby tech. So I have a few questions I'd like to ask um, Mr. Mahoney, if I might, Mr. Moderator. Yes, uh, please, Mr. Benson, go ahead. Thank you. Is 686 students the maximum capacity at Minuteman? It's slightly above uh, maximum. What has uh, Minuteman done in the past couple of years to try to reduce its expenses? The, the challenge that we have with reducing expenses is we do have increased enrollment, um, and we need to support that increased enrollment. I'm not sure about uh, uh, the source of your numbers, but if you're just simply taking the bottom line of assessments, uh, I don't believe, and I could be wrong, but I don't believe that uh, Shawshin's carrying um, uh, uh, debt service 
to the level that we're carrying debt service. And I think you alluded to like a $3 million variance. And if Shaoxing is not carrying any debt service, 1.8 of it is related to the debt service that we, we talked about in the, in the cost components. So without knowing the complete breakdown, I, couldn't, I, I, I can't really respond to that. But we've been in an environment now where we're seeing enrollment increase. And in, 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 in that type of environment, it's a little bit difficult to be you, trying to. You didn't to. give us a breakout of the budget, so it was a little difficult to look behind these numbers and see what they were. I took a look at the um, breakout that Shoshin gives to its um, member communities, and there's much more detail, so it was much easier for me to look at that. So I would appreciate if next year we get a better breakout of the budget. How much state aid does uh, Minuteman get annually um, that goes into the budget? And if you just offer your, your name and title, please. Do you have um, you have, oh, you, your name and title, please? Hi, I'm Nikki Andre, the business manager at Minuteman. Do you have, do you know how much do you have? Yeah, do, do you have an answer yeah. for uh, yeah. Mr. Benson's The question? Chapter 70 state aid was 2.9 million. And that's our estimate for FY25 budget as well. Is there any transportation aid from the state? Yes, that's around uh, 800,000. Shoshin, by the way, gets $1 million per year in transportation aid and gets $6,706,000 per year in Chapter 78, significantly more than Minuteman gets. I don't have an explanation. I'm not sure what to do with this from here other than I wanted to make sure everybody understood what the wide disparity is and to see if um, our representatives to Minuteman can take a look at is there more that can be done because I don't question the great education that students get there. I just question the cost compared to a nearby competitor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tosti might have an answer to that question. Mr. Tosti? Just a couple of explanations. Um, one is uh, Minuteman represents a much, much wealthier district than Shaoxin. Uh, Shaoxin's district is fairly middle class. Uh, when you throw in towns like Dover and Weston, Arlington's actually the, one of the poorest towns in Minuteman. And the state aid is largely based on, to a certain degree, on wealth. The wealthier your, your, your property tax base, the less state aid you're going to get. The, one of the other elements in comparison is, I can't remember the exact enrollment at Shaoxin, but it's much bigger. You have a, uh, uh, a much smaller school, and uh, with a larger school, you have certain uh, benefits of size. So those are just two thoughts to keep in mind. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. Uh, next up is Mr. Rudiman, and then after that, Mr. Stephen Moore. And also, I just want to ask, uh, is there a microphone in the balcony? And if there isn't, uh, can someone get a microphone up there? OK, Mr. Ruderman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. And speaking for myself and not for the Finance Committee, if we could return to the presentation that we just saw, could you bring up the slide again about the uh, different trend lines in the enrollments, students coming from in-district towns versus students coming from out-of-district towns? Well, I'll get started. Uh, I believe the numbers I saw were approximately the school year uh, 2000, yes, uh, 2016, 238 students from out of district within reasonable approach of the number of students from in district towns. This year, this year fall into 37. Um, Mr. Mahoney, were any out of district students accepted for the incoming class in, in this last year of applications? Right now, we received uh, 175 in-district applications. All of those applications were accepted. A recommendation was made to the school committee back in the fall to limit our, um, our uh, 
accepted applications to 175, so it just happened to come in at that level at our initial acceptance. We've had about seven or eight of those students decline their acceptance. Uh, and as of this point, we, um, and we're following up on some late applications from in-district uh, member town students um, in awaiting their decisions. We have not accepted any uh, out-of-district students as of this time. No acceptances for out-of-district students. I would consider this to be a promise fulfilled. Those of us who were part of the campaign to secure your uh, agreement to the part of the debt for the new Minuteman school building, uh, one, of the, one of the arguments we made, in fact, one of the slogans we used was, give us a building that was worthy of the education happening inside, and we will fill it, we will fill it with students from our own district. And that has happened. Part of the increase in, in um, the member town's assessments has been the increasing numbers of students from the member towns and conversely, so many fewer students from out of districts that paid an increment above the tuition, which lessened the impact on the member town's assessments. The new building is beautiful. If you've had an opportunity to see it, I know you'll agree with me. If you haven't, you are, I, I, I in, urge you and invite you to make an opportunity to get a look at it in action. I just have one more question. I'd like someone to speak um, to the outcomes. It's close enough now to the end of the school year. I think, I think you would have an idea, would you, uh, where Minuteman students are headed next? And if you could give us a, a rough breakdown, please, of how many are uh, continuing education, how many are uh, you know, going into uh, more training in a vocation. Uh, can you tell us about the outcomes, please? Uh, I can, uh, as far as students graduating this year, we haven't, uh, I haven't reviewed the numbers yet, but if we look at it historically, between 60 and 65% of our students move on to two and four year uh, colleges continuing their majors. Um, another uh, 30 or so percent will, um, will go right out into the trades with the certifications that they've earned as part of their education at Minuteman, and less than 5% may choose to go into the military. Thank you. I, uh, if you look at the range of shops, as they are called, uh, courses of study, majors, concentrations that Minuteman offers. I believe that's another factor inherent in what it costs to run Minuteman, the great variety of programs and pursuits that the students have, it, uh, have the option of following. Uh, and uh, I think there's a success story in that, in that so many of the students uh, within within one or two percent, all of Minuteman students will either be engaged in further education next year or actively pursuing the trade that they have been training for. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Ruderman. We'll take uh, Mr. Stephen Moore next, and then Mr. Kepline is on deck. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Moore, Precinct 18. Um, I want to thank Mr. Ruderman for both of his points. Those were uh, important and part of what uh, I had for questions, so thank you. Um, following on his, uh, uh, some of his points regarding out-of-district members, um, other than in-district members taking uh, the positions, the slots available, so to speak, um, has there been any additional analysis to why, uh, or is that the reason for the drop of out-of-district membership? And secondly, if it's not, has there been analysis done as to why that number is decreasing? It's, it's related to building capacity, frankly. Right. And it, um, it, it, it does suggest, at least in this moment in time, uh, that the building was uh, adequately sized to meet the population demand of our member towns. Perfect. Thank you. That's, a, that's uh, excellent. And uh, just as Mr. Ruderman said, it's a promise fulfilled. Uh, another question about the capital budget increase for uh, the town of Arlington. Uh, I'm wondering if any of that increase is related to the fact it's a new building or is it to do with the fields issue that Mr. Tosti raised? 
Uh, I, I, th I think the debt service is uh, specifically related to the building. Um, the commitment uh, at the time we sought the authorization for the bonding was the debt service related to um, the, uh, the, the fields would be um, offset by revenue collected by the, um, by the rentals of the facilities. In some cases, there are other costs that are, that are covered by the renters, such as the, the lights that they use, uh, the, the maintenance over time that's incurred, and some overhead costs. As far as the operating costs of the field, it's, it's basically those costs that would be associated with whether we were running them or not uh, uh, off hours. So it, just the just day-to-day the, the -day maintenance of the field is included in the assessment. Okay, so part of the increase in the capital uh, assessment is related to the use from rentals and additional use? I mean, no. I'm not quite following, I guess. I'm sorry, let me clarify. Uh, as far as the cost, the, any of the capital costs related to the field, uh, there's no capital cost involved in the, um, related to the fields. Okay. Just on our operating costs, just a, 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 some staffing that we dedicated to our outside maintenance, not the capital. Okay, so related to the capital budget, the increase in the capital budget to the Arlington assessment, um, is that related to the costs related to the new building that perhaps were not projected correctly or, or what, I guess I'm asking? No, um, I think it's a combination of debt service, which we can predict from now okay, to the rest yes. 25 years. Yep. And I did mention also that we increased our capital stabilization account from $500,000 okay. a year to 850 to try and preserve the asset. And there are a couple other uh, very minor uh, capital, annual capital costs that we include each year. Okay, I think, I think we're just showing my ignorance here about uh, what goes into those budgets. So thank you, that, that's helpful. Um, and lastly, I'm aware of some of the issues related to the um, repeated turnover in superintendents. Uh, and I, but I'm wondering, could you give me the dates for the turnover that Mr. Tosti re uh, referenced for when we changed superintendents? Uh, the only date I can give you since I wasn't involved at the time, I was retired and I came back. So the only date I can give you is I started the end of May last year and I'll be ending the end of June this year. Okay, I understand. I, again, I've been a little uh, disconnected from the issues, so I think I understand uh, what's happened. So thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Kepline, you're next. And then on deck is Mr. Andrew Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Um, about uh, last year, about this time, there was a lot of upheaval going with the superintendent of Minuteman. And I'm wondering if what was the cost associated with a parachute to uh, get her out of place and a new one in? There, there was a settlement, it was about 216000 Okay, thank you. Um, I also noted that uh, you have a decrease in energy costs, that you, um, and that's great. Uh, Arlington, FinCom mentioned our electricity cost is up 40%, and we're looking at higher energy prices or costs in Arlington. If you have any words of wisdom or how you're able to decrease your energy costs. I wouldn't necessarily call them words of wisdom. However, I think that um, we tried to take advantage in building the new building to try uh, to, to maximize use of solar technology. It helped with our leads point, which helped reduce the, uh, which increased the uh, reimbursement from the state on the, uh, uh, for, for the building project, and it's also translated into a reduction in our operating costs. Okay, do you still use gas heat? In the building? Yes, we, it's partially gas and, and electric, yes. All right, and can you give me a breakout on how much utility costs are on gas and how much electricity? Yeah, it's about 500,000, hmm? 500,000. Combined or yes, each? Yes, combined. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fisher's next, and then after that on deck will be Ms. Dre. Are we getting? 
Are we getting feedback through the? I assume I'm not the only one hearing the feedback. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Seems better now. I think there's someone in a room somewhere turning dials, so let's see if that works. Mr. Fisher? Um, Andrew Fisher, uh, Precinct 6. I'm, I'm uh, interested to know the status of the lawsuit that had to do with not admitting uh, some students. So the question was a lawsuit involving what? Uh, maybe it's long past. The, the Minuteman has a cutoff, I believe. Um, what is, put it this way, what is the cutoff? Is there a cutoff? Do you have to have a certain grade point average to get into the school? Uh, and I thought there was a lawsuit about this. I, I can comment, <clears throat> generally speaking, on a statewide basis that there is some uh, activity uh, going on around proposed legislation that will change the way many, most vocational technical schools go through their admissions process, um, where uh, we go through and many others go through a, um, a five-stage process in reviewing a, an application and, and getting acceptance. Uh, a lot of those points relate to um, tuition, conduct, grades, a uh, letter of recommendation from the sending uh, district counselor, and an interview uh, with, uh, with our uh, admissions director. And there's um, some activity about whether or not that's, that's fair or whether that's, uh, that's um, holding down uh, some disadvantaged class uh, of, of, of students. And there's a proposed lottery system that's being out there, but that has not affected at this point Minuteman and to the point where we were able to accept all of our in-district applications this year. So it's not necessarily a, a, an issue for Minuteman, but it's certainly an issue statewide because the, the, the demand for vocational education uh, exceeds the number of seats that are available in most, most school uh, regional vocational technical school districts. Okay. So did I hear you correctly to say that all of your applicants were accepted this year? That's correct. Excellent. What, what would be criteria for not accepting them? Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, I think it's the, 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 it's the um, of the five criteria, there needs to be certain level of standard. What we really concentrate on, I think, um, in the interview process is a willingness of the student to want to pursue um, a, a vocational technical education. Sometimes in, in, um, in having those interviews, you could tell why the student's there. Conduct's a big issue too. Uh, many of our shops handle power tools and things of that nature, and we want to make sure that student conduct is appropriate in, uh, for that environment. Well, I'm delighted to hear that everyone was accepted, and I gotta say, I'm there's an echo. I'm not understanding a lot of what you're saying. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dre next, and then after that, uh, Mr. Jalkett. Good evening, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. Um, it caught my ear when you were talking about the East Building that you're thinking of expanding into. Is that currently Minuteman property? Yes. Okay. So the daycare that's there, and I don't know if there was other businesses, are they going to be relocated or where will they go? They're no longer there. They, okay, it so was in the past they used them. Perfect. So that's currently empty and available for you, for you to use for your animal science. That's correct. Wonderful. What is your anticipated ongoing capital cost of developing that project? It's still way too early. We're guess estimating right now um, that it's a, it's a 16,000 square foot building and we're thinking it's about a, a thousand, uh, $1,000 a square foot to renovate. So there may be some phasing of that because of the way the building's laid out. There's a wing with 10,000 square feet and another wing with 6,000 square feet. So depending on the opportunities, uh, we'd like to see if there's a way that we can do that through uh, our, our, uh, our own um, stabilization funding, uh, perhaps some state capital uh, grant funds, maybe a partnership. Uh, we, we could have an industry partner participate as well. But I think it would be a challenge for the district to ask the member towns for an investment in that, at least at this point, 
uh, without either offering a new program that might attract new students or some type of a, a opportunity for increased enrollment. So would it be fair to summarize that to say that you're looking to fund that through resources that are not increasing the cost per member town? That's the goal. The goal. How, we, how, how that process plays out will be to be determined. Okay. And my last question is, do you have any insight why the Arlington Town enrollment has been decreasing? I have some anecdotal comments about that. Yeah. Um, I think that with the, the uh, Arlington High School coming online, I think that's mm -hmm. particularly attractive to some of uh, 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 the Arlington Middle School students. We've had uh, great relationships with the uh, administration at uh, Arlington Middle, those schools. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, oftentimes at our uh, uh, showcase events or things like that, we do have a lot of students that come by from Arlington that like to look and see. But at the end of the day, we do hear comments was this is a cool school, but I think we're gonna go to the new school in Arlington. So I think we're seeing a lot of that. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next up, Mr. Jalkett, and then after that, Ms. Pyle. Thank you, Daniel Jalkett, Precinct 6, move to terminate debate on Article 45. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and a second. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 45, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. The debate is terminated. So we will go to a vote on the main motion under Article 45, which calls for an appropriation of Eight million five hundred sixty-two thousand two hundred and twenty-nine dollars um, for the purpose of paying the town's apportioned share of the operating and maintenance costs uh, of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School budget. And so let's take a let's open up voting. Voting is now open on that. So if you're in favor of that appropriation of roughly eight and a half million dollars, vote one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay. Voting's about to close. And it passes 210 in the affirmative, uh, uh, two in the negative and two abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Article 45 is disposed of. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Mr. Wagner, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. The general example given for a point of order is, I can't hear. Well, I don't know if it's been made clear, but over the last two nights, the sound really, and I've heard people whispering behind me that they can't hear either. The sound is not adequate. I would ask, please, Mr. Moderator, if the town could make uh, checks or improvements in the sound before the next uh, meeting of town meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll see if there's anything we can do during the, the, uh, the break as well. Um, okay, uh, Ms. Deschler. I move that Article 16 through 44 be taken from the table. We have a motion to take Article 16 through 44, the, uh, the ones that have not yet been disposed uh, from the table. We have a second. All those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. So that uh, brings us back to Article 16. Uh, so before we bring up any speakers on this, uh, let's um, uh, show the speaker queue. And we'll clear that so everyone can see. And so speaker queue is now cleared, um, starting with a fresh queue. And so uh, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, did you want to introduce the select board's recommended vote on Article 16, please? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The uh, select board moved, voted favorable action by a five to zero vote to ban pet sales and pet shops. Uh, I understand the proponent is going to be making a presentation um, that with slides that are uh, within the annotated warrant. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kepka? 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Asha Kepka, Precinct 1. I'd like to introduce Laura Kiesel, who's going to speak and present the article. Okay, and uh, Ms. Kiesel is a resident of Arlington, correct? Yes, she is. Okay, then she has the right to speak. Um, okay, I believe uh, Ms. Kiesel uh, uh, would be connecting from the satellite room. Could we bring up video of the satellite room? Oh, then we won't be able to see the slides. Okay, so the, the slides are up. Um, so we can see Ms. Kiesel, hello. Welcome to town meeting. And uh, so I guess in the main hall, we can only see this. I've paused the timer here, don't worry. The, um, uh, we'll show the slides here if that's okay while, while you speak. And then you can, can see. I your, see. Will I see the slides? Yes. Yeah, you should be able to see us okay. and the slides and the two displays there. Uh, all set? And so, okay. There you go. okay, so we can see the slides now. So um, uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Kiesel. Great, thank you so much for, for taking my presentation tonight. My name is Laura Kiesel. I am an Arlington resident of Precinct 7, and tonight I will be presenting on Article 16, uh, the Humane Pet Shop Warrant, which is basically a prohibition or a ban on the sale of live pets in Arlington. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick overview. This prohibition will not apply to animal shelters or private breeders selling directly to people or households. It would enable partnerships between pet shops and animal rescues so that those animal rescues could use those spaces in pet stores to adopt out pets as is occurring um, in next door in Cambridge at PetSmart where they have enacted a similar pet ban that we are attempting tonight. And this is essentially a preventative measure. Uh, currently 14 municipalities in the Commonwealth have enacted a pet sale ban of some sort, including the state of New York. So we want to make sure that as that market shrinks, it does not shift into Arlington. This is basically about addressing the issue of pet mills and poaching animals from the wild. Next slide, please. So currently there are no pet shops in Arlington that sell live animals. We do have a pet co, but it only sells goods and services. But again, we wanna make sure that that pet code does not expand to sell animals or that another pet store does not move in. Next slide, please. So 2.6 million puppies are born from puppy mills every year in the United States, and there's a competitive rate for kittens as well. But meanwhile, there are 1 million dogs and cats that are euthanized every year in the United States. So what we are trying to address is the issue of too many animals and too few homes. Next slide, please. So in attempting to not add to that surplus, we don't want to just emphasize puppies and kittens, but this is a, an issue that affects all animals that are popularly sold as pets, including mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And that is why uh, this warrant is comprehensive to include all of those. And that latter provision, provision for fish was added in at the select board's recommendation. Next si slide, please. So why not just mammals? So just as there are puppy and kitten mills, there are actually pet mills for every type of pet that is popularly sold as um, in pet stores. There are parrot mills, there are reptile mills, there are even multi-species mills. And these are large industrial sized mills and warehouses where animals are kept by the hundreds or thousands in cramped, filthy cages. In addition to being very stressful and cruel for the animals themselves, this also makes it more likely that there will be a disease outbreak that can jump to and impact people. Um, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish are not protected by the Animal Welfare Act um, as dogs, cats, and rabbits are. So these animals actually need additional protections. Also, reptiles, birds, and fish, and amphibians suffer extremely high mortality rates that are the ones that are sold in pet stores. 70 to, 75 to 90% die either before the point of sale or within their first year of purchase. Many of the animals that are milled are actually poached from the wild, and this is um, causing the endangerment of these animals in their native ecosystems. Some examples of that are the African gray parrot and the Madagascar radiant tortoise, and this is adversely impacting our global biodiversity. Next slide, please. When it comes to fish, Currently, 1 billion fish from 5,400 species are traded in the ornamental fish trade globally every year. And the United States, by far, is the number one importer of fish. And the demand for pet fish is contributing to the degradation of our coral reefs, which are critical for ocean health and a livable climate. Next slide, please. 
The other problem is that former pets are becoming invasive species. Because so many people cannot care for these animals or they don't have the homes for them, what happens is they wind up releasing them into our environment where they are becoming invasive species and are encroaching on our native species. Currently, there are 56 species of pet birds in the United States, including in the Northeast and Massachusetts. Uh, one prominent example of that is the monk parakeet, pictured um, top right. And also for turtles, the red-eared slider. 12 years ago, you could buy several red-eared sliders at any pet store in Massachusetts, but 10 years ago, they had to ban their sale because people were releasing them by the hundreds to thousands in our ponds and riverways where they have now established breeding populations and they are crowding out our native turtles, many of which are endangered or threatened. And even though that pet sale ban has helped a little bit, there are emerging threats with other pet turtles. Um, and that, native, that red eared slider pictured there, bottom right, is actually one here in Arlington at the Mystic River. Next slide, please. The same applies to pet fish. The most notorious and ubiquitous example of that are the goldfish that have also been released by the thousands into our native waterways, where they are crowding out and outcompeting our native fish and other aquatic species and driving them to the brink of extinction. Next slide, please. So we have widespread support for this warrant. Dozens of Arlington residents signed our warrant petition. The select board, um, favored it with a unanimous five to zero vote in favor and expanded its protections to also encompass fish. We have the support of the MSPCA, the Animal Defense League, the Boston Animal Rescue League, but additionally we also have the support of many smaller dog and cat rescues as well as the two major rabbit rescues, the two major parrot rescues that service Massachusetts and the Turtle Rescue League, which is the leading uh, wildlife rehabilitation facility for turtles in Massachusetts, and have noted the impact of pet turtles on turtle species, and they take in pet turtles to try to um, mitigate that impact. But unfortunately, all of these rescues are inundated, and they note that pet shop pets are a big part of that problem. So we hope that tonight the town meeting will also support this warrant in its original iteration and make sure that this includes comprehensive protections for all the species that were included. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Kiesel, for a very well-timed presentation. Um, we also have uh, an amendment. Uh, Mr. Varaglou, did you want to introduce that? Yes, please. Yes. And actually, before we take Mr. Varaglou, uh, I see that the speaker queue is cleared. Is, is that, have there been no speakers to? Oh, I, I wasn't checking text, so. We've lost the speaker queue, so those five people that were on there have to be Okay, so uh, the speaker queue, I just have two names on it right now, Mix Pretzer and uh, Mr. Wagner. Uh, who, uh, Mr. Wagner, you dropped off the queue. You're back on the queue. Okay. Um, yeah, what, uh, okay, names are coming in now, and so, uh, Mr. Varglou, uh, apologies for that. Uh, go ahead. Which microphone? There's two microphones here. I think one of them is a light, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mustafa Varglou, Precinct 10. I put in an amendment to this article to um, basically rem oh, so, I'm sorry. Um, I put in an amendment into this, to this article to remove uh, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, and leaving mammals as the uh, prohibited animals, as um, the article states. So I want to recognize a few things as I, as I stand here. There are, as mentioned, no pet shops in Arlington, so, and this article and amendment um, would not address a current problem, and we may never have a pet shop in this town. I do want to point out we do have a bait shop that has been here for generations. I don't know if this article will or will not uh, um, affect the bait shop in East Arlington, so there may be an immediate effect from this article if fish are re uh, retained on the article. I also want to recognize that animal cruelty is a terrible thing, and um, the organizations that support this article are doing great work, and I, I fully support reducing animal cruelty, though I do think this article goes too far in terms of reducing options for people and attacks the problem at the wrong end. Um, my motivation is that, as I mentioned, um, it's ba based on personal reasons and just this general principle that at some point it will be very hard for people to get pets other than dogs, cats, and rabbits from um, 
shelter, um, rescue shelters, and I think we're going to lose a lot of opportunities for people to learn about other animals. Um, so when you look at some of these other animals, there, and I've worked at pet shops as a teenager and into my 20s, and, um, and as you'll hear from other reasons, we've been you know, frequenting other pet shops. There, there are some animals that basically it's very hard to get any kind of selection from that's not at a pet shop. If this is something that interests your family or may interest your family in the future, you're basically going to reduce the opportunity to um, have access to these, and it's a very um, homogenous world we'll end up in, I guess. Um, when you're at pet shops, you get a chance to observe the animals, learn, and choose more specialized species if that's in your interest. So specifically for my family, my two daughters at different times wanted lizards. We went to a good pet shop, Jabberwock, um, formerly in Winchester, now Stoneham. Um, one of, you know, they spoke with the owners. One of them was going to get a chameleon. She was setting that chameleon. She realized that that was the wrong pet for her. She did not want that. She wouldn't be able to care for it properly. She switched directions, got a different, um, she got a gecko. Um, the other daughter wanted a bearded dragon, had done a lot of research, and that was confirmed by being at the pet shop. There was a photo of bearded dragons um, shown in the previous slide. Um, when they're young, they congregate. When they're older, they, they go their own way and don't. They actually fight if they get together. So that was fairly normal, what was shown in that photo. Um, I'd also like to point out that when we go to a pet shop, there's little knowledge of the breeding history of the animals that you're looking at. And as people that have also have a dog and a cat, or a cat and a uh, bird from individual breeders, we have very little knowledge of the heritage of the animals that we got. I don't think there's a big difference, frankly, for the lay person to know what they're getting, whether it's from a breeder or a pet shop. And I think singling out pet shops is a disadvantage. Um, we were asked very rudimentary questions by the breeders that we went to for the animals we got. Um, frankly, we have a far better relationship with the pet shop and far more feedback and learning from them than we have from individual breeders. And um, I will um, just bring up quickly um, that um, I think people would be able to keep a much wider variety of pets if this article does not pass. And I think there's a better way to deal with animal cruelty um, which is to go to the source of it and legislate for these animals. Um, if the moderator would allow, there is a town resident who has a lot of experience in the field of um, fish and aquariums as an environmental consultant, um, George Buckley. Would he be allowed to speak during this time? To and, my amendment? Uh, he is a, uh, a town resident? Yes, he's a town resident, Precinct right 16. Yeah. Uh, you might want to move your motion in case you run out of time. Um, yes, I'd like to move my motion. I don't know what the words are. Yeah, we, uh, with motion to thank you. Uh, yeah. okay. Thank you. The amendment is now before us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. And Mr. your speaker. Please at the back of the room. If you'd like to come up, sir. If he's yeah, that, uh, name and address, please. Greetings. My name is George Buckley, a member of Precinct 16 for many decades. Thank, Thank you. you for allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, I come here to very strongly ask you to vote for the, the amendment as proposed by Mr. Uglu or vote no on, on, on Article 16. The reason, my main reason is fish should never have been included. Uh, Simon Montgomery, who some of you may know as a major author, natural history writer, uh, wrote a great award-winning book, Amazon Adventure. And in it, she talked about a tiny fish is helping to save the Amazon. And that tiny fish is the Cardinal Leon Tetra. And that tiny fish is harvested locally by local village people who then work to protect that environment, the water and the jungle. Those fishes are then exported and sold around the world. And if we continue to ban this type of thing, those villages, those Amazon areas will be lost. Uh, I worked on that project with New England Aquarium staff for 20 years. Scott Dow, some of you know, Danny Laughlin, and it's been a huge success. There's other programs like that that have been huge successes in breeding fish. 90% of the fish sold in pet shops or through the uh, internet are freshwater. Over 95% of those are bred in captivity. I've worked on those projects often and regularly in my career. And uh, what, what's interesting is even marine tropicals now are bred in captivity. The clownfish, for instance, I worked on with Philippe Cousteau and Dr. David Vaughn at, at Harbor Ranch Oceanographic. 95% now are bred in captivity. There are solutions to, to this problem 
but it, it can't be done quickly. We need to vote the article down and rewrite sections over the summer, allowing only naturally sustainably harvested fish from the wild and naturally bred fish to be sold. It's critical that we not shut off avenues like this. Young aquarists who started breeding and uh, zebra fish 30 or 40 years ago led to MIT being able to have the world's top zebra fish study and breeding facility. They went to the Boston Aquarium Society, local people like you and I that had home aquaria that knew how to breed those fish so they could learn how to do it. And we've got to be really careful in, in trying to do something good that we don't do bad. In the end, it's the precautionary principle, do no harm. So I'd ask you to vote 16 down, vote for the amendment, Amendment. If you can't vote for the amendment, vote 16 down. Let's rewrite that so it's a much better, much more workable thing. And we have been selling fish for decades here already in East Arlington with the bait shop there. And unfortunately, it's closed right now due to a family illness, but I was hoping to have them come chat with you about that. Uh, the other things yeah. are that. I'm sorry, the, we're, 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 we're at time. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And I see uh, town council was gesturing. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, either you have a legal opinion or you own a bait shop. Do you want to speak? Okay. Both, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I just want to respond to the question regarding the bait shop. Um, I note that in Section 1C of the proposed bylaw, it defines pet shop as, quote, means a retail establishment where animals are sold or offered for sale as pets which is required to be licensed pursuant to MGL Chapter 129, Section 39A and 330 CMR 12. Uh, bait shops are licensed pursuant to uh, General Law Chapter 130, Section 80, so this bylaw would not impact the bait shop. Thank you. Okay, can we show the speaker queue? And apologies that uh, that got cleared out. I, actually, before Mr. Newton comes up, um, uh, I'm gonna select a name that I don't think we've heard speak yet, uh, Mr. Prokosh. Pass. Okay, Mr. Newton. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10, to move to terminate debate on Article 16 and all items. Okay, we have a motion to terminate, terminate debate, and we have uh, a second. Uh, this is for um, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 16 and all matters before it, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. The debate continues. Uh, Let's see, Mr. Schlickman, I, you might have been first on the list before it got cleared, I don't recall, but why don't you come up and speak, since you're close to the microphone, and then after that, we'll take Mr. Revelak. Thank you, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I rise to introduce Carrie Thiel, a resident of Arlington, Lakeview Street, who would like to address the town meeting. Okay, she, she's a resident, so she has the right to speak. He has, I'm sorry, he has the right to speak. Mr. Moderator, thank you very much. Carrie Teal, Precinct 10. Uh, I will be brief. I have spent the last 25 years uh, working in the animal welfare field on an unrelated issue. Uh, my nonprofit organization, which is an international organization that works on an animal welfare issue, is a stone throw from this debate tonight. Although I've not worked on this issue, I have been around people who have worked on this pet shop and overpopulation issue over the last two decades. Uh, and it, it's been a part of my life. My mother, as I was growing up, constantly was rescuing dogs. I grew up in a house with six, eight, ten dogs. I broke up a lot of dog fights, I can tell you. Now she rescues cats. I'm sure Paul, my good friend Paul, appreciates that as a cat owner. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to say how many cats she has, but she has a lot. There are so many people in our community who literally bend over backwards and make so many sacrifices to help animals dying in shelters because there are still today a lot of animals dying in shelters. Close to a million animals a year na nationally are dying in shelters. Thousands of animals die in shelters in Massachusetts. And there has been years and years of policy work on this issue because at some point people said, you know what, I am tired of going to the shelter week after week after week and saving as many as I can while others die. And so 
very smart policy solutions have been crafted around this issue. Article 16 is a great example of that. This is, didn't come out of nowhere. This is something that people have been working on and fighting for, for again, for decades. There are uh, laws being fought for at the federal level on this issue, at the state level, and at the local level. And I would also just say, to me, this is about who we are. It's not just about helping animals. It's not just about stopping that pet overpopulation, but it's a reflection of our values. That's why I am so proud that my nonprofit is based here. It's why I am so proud that we, Arlington has time and again stood with the animals on the Greyhound Racing vote, on the Trapping Ballot vote, on the article a few nights ago, time and again, you have been here for the animals, and I ask you to be there again for the animals tonight and support this, this good warrant article. Finally, I, you know, I was going to address the bait shop issue. I, I'm grateful for uh, the town council who clarified that. This also will not prohibit the breeding of fish, will not prohibit the private sale of fish. None of the things that were talked about are addressed, that were raised earlier, are addressed by this warrant article. None of them. This is a carefully crafted warrant article, and as, uh, as Laura said in presenting this, it was the select board that said, can we make this stronger? That is something I'm appreciative of and grateful for. So I ask you, please vote yes on this article, vote down the amendment, and cast another good vote tonight for the animals. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll take Mr. Revlock next, and after that, uh, Ms. Friedman. Was he? Re I think names were removed from the list. No. Okay, name was removed, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Friedman? And then after Ms. Friedman, uh, uh, we'll take uh, uh, Mr. Hamlin, I don't think we've heard from yet. Ms. Friedman? Um, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. And I rise in favor of the amendment opposed to the main article. I think the main article goes way too far. And I agree that it's given that there are so many cats and dogs in shelters that sale of mammals should be prohibited, but not, you know, some of the other species that are listed in this article. So I hope you vote yes on the amendment, and if that doesn't pass, no on the main article. Thank you. Thank you. So take uh, Mr. Hamlin next, and then uh, Mix Pretz okay, Mix Pretzer from the satellite room, please, and then Mr. Oster. Uh, David Pretzer, Precinct 17. Uh, I just want to... Because they're taking them out of order because everything got jumbled. Uh, and, and also, it's at my discussion. Uh, sorry for the interruption, Mr. Uh, 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 Mix Pretzer. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just want to um, reiterate, you know, this is not... You know, I think the animal cruelty aspects of the main motion are very compelling. I also just want to reiterate the um, ecological impact. Um, you know, you know, stray cats and dogs are a big issue, but also when reptiles, amphibians, fish are released into the wild that can really do, be devastating to native species. We have a lot of problems with our na uh, natural areas in Arlington and, and, in the, and in our vicinity, and I think we need to be doing more to support and safeguard our native species, and I think this is one way of doing that. When people, uh, uh, pets sold at pet stores are more likely to be Im uh, impulse purchases that um, people might not know what they're getting into. Like, I'm glad some people have had great experiences at pet stores, but there are plenty of um, people that have had um, not been informed when buying a pet at a pet store and then later are unable to care for it or unwilling to care for it, and it is released in the wild, and it can cause great damage to our environment. I also wanted to remind everyone that this ban is limited to retail pet stores. You can still purchase cats, dogs, birds, fish, uh, reptiles, amphibians from private breeders in addition to rescue sites. I know we're all more familiar with cat and dog rescues, but there are plenty of opportunities for rescuing other types of animals, either via the internet or via specialized rescues. So I do not think passing this measure will prevent anyone from obtaining a pet lizard, a pet fish, a pet snake. If that's what they want, they you know, might make it 
You might need to do a bit more research, but I think before acquiring a pet like that, you should be doing your research anyways. And so I think that's a win, both for lovers of you know, more unusual pets and for our environment. So I urge you to vote against the amendment and for the main motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I said Mr. Oster next. Pass. Uh, Mr. Wagner. And that's not a reward for the outburst, by the way. And then after that, Mr. Rudick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Uh, I think the proponents have a good purpose, which is to prevent animal cruelty, which we all care about or should. Uh, but I don't think that government succeeds by telling 40,000 people you can't have pets if we want to prevent cruelty to animals. I would ask that you vote no on this article and seek instead a way for Arlington to improve the safety and health of animals, not to go for something like they have here. Uh, should we be preventing people from eating meat because we don't think it's right? Should we be, should we be legislating a limit that is not intended to, to stop harm? It's simply going to stop business and people from enjoying pets. So I ask you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Mr. Rudick? And then Ms. Brown after that. I think it should be Mrs. Brown actually. Van Rudick, Precinct 5, I move to terminate debate. Under, all. Under everything in the universe. <laughs> I don't think we have that kind okay. of power. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 16 and all matters before it. Uh, all, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. No. Debate is terminated. So we will first vote on the Varglu Amendment. So if we, uh, everyone should have a copy of this. So we're not going to run through it in detail, but it's essentially uh, removing birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish from the prohibition, leaving just mammals. Um, okay, I think we're still letting folks the speaker queue, but um, so if we, could, if we can bring up a vote on the Varglu uh, amendment. Okay, voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Varglu amendment to retain the, uh, the ban on the sale of mammals, but to remove the ban on birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, vote one for yes. If you want to leave birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish in the uh, ban, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, voting will close shortly. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails, uh, 79 in the affirmative, 130 in the negative, three abstentions. So the main motion uh, remains unamended, not amended. Uh, so now let's take a vote on the main motion under Article 16, which is still the recommended vote of the select board. And so I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but this uh, voting is open now. So if you're in favor of amending Title I of the town bylaws to add a new provision to ban the sale of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish in pet shops within the town, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed to that ban, uh, press two for no. And three to abstain. This is a majority vote. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion passes, 173 in the affirmative, 42 in the negative, two abstentions. Um, that takes us to Article 17, and it's uh, 9.30, so we will break for 10 minutes. Please be back in your seats and ready to go in 10 minutes. Oh, and also, and we'll, we'll do swearing in for any town meeting members who haven't been sworn in yet. Uh, you can find uh, Ms. Brazil, find the town clerk, and she'll get you sworn in during the break. Thank you. 10 minutes. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, everyone, we're getting started.
Okay, that brings us to Article 17. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mr. Moderator, I would like to lay Article 17 on the table, and, and the reason for that is the proponents, you'll, you'll see, have a substitute motion. There are some issues within the substitute motion that the pr proponents will be working out with the town manager, and we thought for a more complete, a tighter presentation between the select board report and the uh, substitute motion, it should be done on the same night. So we're asking to lay it on the table with the intent that we would come back next Wednesday should the special town meeting conclude uh, at that time. Okay, we have motion to lay Article 17 on the table. Second. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of laying Article 17 on the table say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is laid on the table. That brings us to Article 18. Um, let's see. Uh, and this is a, uh, the recommended vote of no action. Um, and this, what the, let's say, Mr. Wagner had requested a hold from the consent agenda. Uh, I believe the, uh, the, the reasoning was that uh, a resident was expected to provide a substitute, but that did not materialize. That's still correct, Mr. Wagner? Okay. Uh, so we have a no action vote ahead of us. So there is no scope for debate. Um, so we will go straight to a vote. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, and, and Mr. Cunningham, this by any chance require electronic vote? Do you know for Article 18? No. Okay, so we'll do a voice vote on no action. Um, uh, all those in favor of no action under uh, the main motion of Article 18 say yes. yes. All those opposed? <laughs> it's a majority vote. We will do nothing. Okay, that brings us to Article 19. Um, let's see, Mr. DeCourcy? Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. That brings us to Article 20, uh, Home Rule legis legislation related to the town clerk's position. Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the select board moved to favorable action by unanimous vote. Um, this is the home rule legislation that would convert the town clerk position from an elected position to an appointed position. We'd acted on this previously at town meeting. The referendum this April, uh, voters approved it by a, a 59% um, was, was the uh, favorable vote on that. And, and what it requires is an act of, we need leg legislative approval um, to approve the amendment to the town manager act. And I will say that this language is is identical to what we used or very similar to what we used when we converted the treasurer's position from an elected position to an appointed position. Okay, one second. Okay, and we have a, uh, we have a motion from, uh, an amendment from Mr. Warden. Mr. Warden, did you wanna introduce your amendment? And also before, as uh, Mr. Warden's making his way up, can we show the speaker queue, please? It was just recently cleared and we have two names on there. Um, okay. And then uh, let's switch back now to uh, Mr. Warden's amendment under Article 20. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, uh, John Warden. John Warden, Precinct 8. Uh, Mr. Warden, can you just, uh, take the microphone down? Oh, close there you go. Is. Thank you. Well, I know some people have been having, some people, including me, have been having difficulty hearing the microphone, so I hope everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, the, my, my, uh, my amendment uh, would simply uh, provide that although the town clerk uh, would be appointed by the manager, the, um, that person should be a resident of the town of Arlington. And I, I, I say that because I think uh, of, of, the, of, all the, of all the many officials we have appointed and elected that the average citizen uh, has, comes in contact with, the town clerk and, and, and her staff are the, are the face of the town for most people. It starts when, if you're born, well, when you're born, your parents come in, maybe you get a birth certificate. Uh, at the other end, after you die, your children come in to get a death certificate. 
Um, if you want to vote, you have to come into the clerk's office to register. If you want to get, like all few folks did, want to run for town meeting, you come to the town clerk's office to get your nomination papers, and then you go back there to file them. And uh, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's different, and you may never have occasion to meet with the select board members or the manager or the treasurer. You might go into the treasurer's office to give one of the clerks some money, like, like we all did last year, uh, last week or early this week. But uh, it's the town clerk's offices where practically everybody has to go one, one time or another. And so I think it's important that that, that uh, one that uh, interfaces most with the public uh, should be one of the people in our town. And um, um, I mean, we had an extraordinary case where the, where, where the, the, the town clerk uh, was summoned uh, from her home uh, at early in the morning to, because of a prospective bridegroom who, who forgot to uh, get a marriage license. But she came then down to town hall and helped him. Now, if the town clerk was somebody who was appointed from, I don't know, any Bill Ricker or somewhere, uh, would they do that? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, and, and it seems to me that this town of 46,000 people, of whom probably 20-some thousand are adults, that the talent and requirements to serve as town clerk could be found without, you don't have to go have a worldwide search to find someone who would be that kind of person who would be a good town clerk. So, uh, and, and I think we ought to have at least one of our uh, officials, somebody who is, 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 lives in the town, knows the town, has been familiar with it, uh, and knows its people. So I, I, I ask you to support my amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Warren, can you make the motion? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, I move that the, the, uh, the uh, 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 recommended vote of the, board of, uh, the select board uh, be amended by adding to it the, the words, uh, uh, the town clerk, uh, uh, the appointee shall be a resident of the town of Arlington and the place indicated in my amendment. Okay, we have a motion to amend. Do we have a second? We have a second. Thank uh, you. It is, your amendment is now pending before us. Thank you. Uh, let's see. From the speaker queue, first we'll take uh, Ms. LaCourte and then Mr. Moore. Mr. Christopher Moore. Annie LaCourte, Precinct 13. Um, first, I have a question for um, Mr. Marderay, I believe, Town Council. Um, if we add the phrase in question to the line in question, is it clear that it only applies to the clerk as opposed yeah. to the other offices mentioned in the sentence? Yeah, I received this question um, by email, and, and uh, Mr. Cunningham, feel free to add to it, uh, that based on context and also history, which would be taken into account if this got litigated, uh, there would be a very clear case that contextually applies only to the clerk's position. Mr. Cunningham, is there anything to add to that? No, Mr. Okay. Thank you. So there are two reasons for us to have an appointed clerk. The first reason to have an appointed clerk is because it allows us to put a professional into what is an operational position, not a policy-making position where we would normally want someone who represents us who therefore is a resident of the town and who's familiar with the culture of the town and the town's needs and so on and so forth in the position. It's a purely operational position. The second reason that we want an appointed clerk is because we do want to be able to search for that professional outside the borders of the town. When you go to the clerk's office, what you want is good service professionally provided and when you are submitting documents or we finish the, the business at the town meeting and home rule petitions have to be filed and so on and so forth. You want to know that the person in the clerk's office knows how to handle all the intricacies of that job and make sure that all of that goes well and that our records are preserved properly and so on and so forth. It might be true that on a Sunday morning when somebody needs their marriage license and they forgot to get it, that if the clerk lives in Cambridge, they couldn't get here and might or might not be motivated to get here really quickly. 
But in the meantime, all the other business of the clerk's office will be running well if we are able to choose our clerk from amongst the best possible candidates interested in the job, regardless of whether or not they live in the town. This is not a position where, when it was an elected position, you had any idea what the clerk was doing in between elections, because the clerk holds no public meetings. Similar to the treasurer's office, these were not offices where it was clear to the public what the person in the office was doing, unless they went to the off treasurer's office to pay a bill or they went to the clerk's office to get their dog license. And even then, you don't really know everything that's going on behind the scenes. You can't tell when you pay your tax bill what the treasurer's investment policy is. You can't tell when you go to the town clerk's office to get your dog license whether or not home rule petitions have been properly filed. We need professionals in this position. We need to be able to seek the best possible professional, and therefore, we should not hamper our hiring capability by adding Mr. Warden's amendment to this article. However, we should pass the main motion as uh, presented by the Board of Selectmen, or Select Board. I'll never get that right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pass. And let's, let's take some new names, that we, or new voices we haven't heard, I think, at this town meeting yet. Uh, Mr. Grunko, and then uh, Mr. Valanki, I don't think we've heard before. Zach Grunko, Precinct 13. I move the question on all matters before it. We have a motion to terminate debate, and we have a second. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 20 and all matters before it, say yes. Yes! All those opposed, say no. No! Uh, debate continues. Uh, Mr. Valanki. Okay. okay, so we have a challenge to the voice vote. Let's bring up a two-thirds vote on termination of debate, and let's make sure we keep the speaker queue. I'll try to take a picture just in case. Okay, Speak, uh, the uh, voting is open. If you're in favor of terminating debate uh, under Article 20, press one for yes. If you wanna continue debate, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And it's terminated. 146 in the affirmative, 65 in the negative. Um, so we'll first vote on the warden amendment. And so the warden amendment would add the restriction that the appointed town clerk uh, needs to be a, a resident of Arlington. Okay, voting is open. If you're in favor of Mr. Warden's amendment to limit the, appointee, the appointed clerk's position to a resident of Arlington, you'd press one for yes, press two to reject that amendment, and three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the amendment fails. 52 in the affirmative, 162 in the negative, two abstentions. Let's bring up a vote now on the main motion under Article 20. Okay. Which would authorize the select board to file, uh, voting is open. So you'd uh, press one if you wish to authorize the select board to file home rule legislation to amend the town manager act to convert the town clerk from an elected to appointed position. Press two uh, for no, to not authorize the select board to do that. And three, to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 173 in the affirmative, 38 in the negative, five abstentions. That brings us now to um, um, Article 21, which was on the consent agenda and was held uh, by Ms. Preston. Um, there was also a substitute motion that was withdrawn. It wasn't really moved, so it doesn't need to be withdrawn, but it will not be made, I believe. And uh, so, Mr. DeCourcy, do you want to uh, just uh, introduce this article? And we also have uh, the Director of Assessments with us tonight, if there's any clarifications needed.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the select board moved no action on this by unanimous vote. So I, we, we thought originally there was going to be a substitute, but I, I, just for the uh, town meetings, for, for clarification purposes, this article was put in initially by the town manager because there was some uncertainty as to how a senior citizen exemption would be applied next year, where the funds would, would um, come. As a result of meetings that we had with the assessors and further clarification, the, the funds would come out of the overlay account, so there's no um, action required by town meeting. And, and for that reason, the town manager recommended that we vote no action, and we did that. Okay. Thank you. And so we don't have any substitute, no, substitute motion. Um, so we will proceed. And so there's, there's nothing to debate here, so we'll proceed straight to uh, uh, a vote on the main motion of no action under Article uh, 21. And uh, Mr. Cunningham, do we need a electronic vote for this for any reason? No. Okay. So we'll just take a voice vote on no action. All those in favor of no action under Article 21, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. It is unanimous. We'll do nothing. And let's see. That takes us to uh, Article 22, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, move to postpone Article 22 until Monday evening. And the reason for that is that the proponent of that is a student at the high school. She's not here this evening. She made a very compelling presentation to us, and I believe she would like to make the same presentation to town meeting. It, it, it was an expectation that we wouldn't reach that uh, article this evening. For that reason, I'd like to give her that opportunity, of course, with the town meeting's approval. Uh, so what, what precisely is the motion? Is it to postpone? Or this is, it is to, to post postpone until Monday evening. Uh, it, is, it is budget night on okay. Monday evening. So uh, is there a particular article before which or after which? Um, yeah, we've, well, we're thinking after budget. Maybe so after. Hang, hang on one second, after, Mr. Moderator. Maybe after the capital budget. Would that be too late? Mr. Diggins, I think, has context because I believe he's been in touch with the speaker. Um, with the, the resident? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Brunner. The motion would be to postpone until after presentation of the capital budget. Okay. After Article 40. Uh, Mr. Diggins, yeah, do you have um, any yeah, context? Leonard Diggins, Precinct 3. Um, actually, the intent was to postpone it until Wednesday, the, the 8th. Yeah. So I thought she had exams on Tuesdays. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. So we're requesting okay. right. uh, to postpone it until um, Wednesday, the 8th, after special town meeting. Okay. No Thank you. Select board working together here. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. <laughs> okay, so is the motion for to postpone until Wednesday? Uh, day certain, Wednesday, right after special town meeting. After special town meeting yes. on Wednesday. Yes. Okay, so we have a majority vote, or a motion, motion with a majority vote uh, to postpone uh, Article 22 uh, until the dissolution of the special town meeting uh, or until after business of the special town meeting on Wednesday. There's reasons for that. Uh, and we have a second. Uh, all those in favor of that postponement, say yes. yes. All those opposed? No. It is postponed. Until after we complete business on the special town meeting on that night. Um, okay. And that brings us now, let's see, it's postponed. And that brings us to Article 23, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The uh, CDBG report it, it, it has been included hard copies in the back of the room and, and on the annotated warrant, and the uh, planning director will be presenting the CDBG report. Okay, and while we have our presenter coming up, can we uh, just show the speaker queue and Show it cleared. Oh, good. So you can click in if you're interested in speaking on this. And let's see. And who is speaking on the CD, uh, CDBG? Ms. Ricker will be oh, speaking. Uh, Director Ricker? Good evening. I'm Claire Ricker. I'm your director of planning and um, community development here. Um, 
I'm going to present the CDBG budget uh, for the year. Uh, the CDBG um, committee had met several times over the spring to discuss um, awards of CDBG funds um, and tried to meet as many requests as possible. We anticipate uh, receiving less funding in program year 50 than we did in program year uh, 49 for a total of about $1,001,000. $1, um, we broke that down into uh, a few categories, one under housing, $200,000 related to capital improvements um, for Caritas Communities and the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Public services, we've had several uh, awardees who've been awarded in the past, continuing their programs um, that have been so helpful in this community uh, for a total of $151,000. Um, uh, public facility improvements, um, mostly capital improvements um, related to um, uh, ADA walkway in the Hauser Building for the Housing Authority, um, Lower Mill Brook Flood Resilience Design, which is a green infrastructure project, um, and then uh, continuing our program of ADA curb ramp installations of a, uh, to the tune of about $100,000. Um, total for public facilities um, improvements this year, about $450,000, and then planning and administration, um, we will offset salaries um, in the Department of Planning and uh, Community Development, about $50,000. Um, for planning studies, um, I've asked for uh, $65,000. It looks like they'd like to award me about uh, $50,000. Um, the grants administrator and general administration of the CDBG program makes up the rest of that funding for about uh, 200,000 totals, and that brings us to the, about the $1 million figure that we will have to disperse this year. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go over to the speaker queue, and uh, we have uh, Ms. Garber first, and then Mr. Kepline. Judith Garber, Precinct 4. Um, I have a question about the Arlington Eats food market that was requested $30,000 and expected to benefit nearly 3,000 individuals. Funding was recommended at $0. Do you know why that, why was that was recommended at $0? Uh, Director Ricker, do you have an answer? Thank you again, Claire Ricker, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, it was, it, there were a lot of conversations about um, different uh, manners of funding, um, and it was determined at the time that Arlington Eats probably has um, other um, pathways to funding and other grant. Um, uh, potential grant awards that they may qualify for. And so, unfortunately, uh, this time around, we weren't able to award them any CDBG dollars. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kepline, and then uh, uh, Ms. Hansen after that. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I've heard various stories from different sources that the nature of the funding for some types of uh, projects involves a repayment period after 15 or 20 years. Is that true or is this purely a grant process and there's no repayment into the fund? Uh, Director Ricker or Mr. Feeney, do you have an answer? Thank you, uh, Claire Rucker, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, it is my understanding uh, that these are grants um, and are not um, subject to repayment um, unless we were to take out a loan uh, to bond against our future grant awards, which is called, I believe, a Section 106 loan. We do not have any of those uh, outstanding at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a fellow town meeting member was curious about the Foot of the Rocks parklet. There's two hundred thousand dollars being allocated to that. It's to be made a public gathering space at the intersection of Mass Ave and Lowell Street. Has has there been a lot of public? Oh, zero. Z the zero figure is zero, I believe. Was not approved. Oh, well, that's good to know. That was Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Ms. Hansen next, and then uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Slickman. Hi, good evening, Linda Hansen, Precinct 9. I also um, just had a question mark about the Arlington Eats um, coming in at a zero dollar amount. Um, I just feel like the need is growing and the 
market is serving around 500 families a week now, which is a 50% increase from what it has been in the past. And while there are other opportunities to raise money for any nonprofit in town, this really feels like a core service that our town provides to the community. And if it seems like there should be some, some form of kind of town buy-in into this program, and this seems like a potentially good source for that. So I really hope that that can be considered in the future. Um, and the other um, requests that were zeroed out, the Foot of the Rocks did get a big chunk of CPA money. And um, I guess Envision Arlington had funds left over from something else. So I just hope that can be taken into consideration in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slickman. And then Mr. Warden. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under this article. Okay, we have, we have motion to terminate debate, and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate uh, under Article 23, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Debate is terminated. Sorry, Mr. Fisher. Okay, we'll take a vote on the main motion of Article 23. Okay, voting is now open. So if you're, in, uh, if you're in favor of endorsing the application for the federal fiscal year 2025 prepared by the town manager and the select board under the Housing and Community Development Act, uh, vote one for yes. If you're opposed to endorsing that, uh, uh, that application, uh, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. And it, uh, the motion passes. Uh, 211 in the, in the affirmative, three in the negative, one abstention. That brings us to Article 24. Uh, Mr. Feeney? Or Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, this is our annual vote to reauthorize the various revolving funds that are contained in the Select Board report. Um, I'd, I'd ask uh, Alex McGee, our uh, uh, Deputy Town Manager of Finance, to uh, present the revolving fund report. Okay. And can we uh, open the speaker queue here before uh, Mr. McGee gets up? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager, Finance Director. Uh, as the town meeting is aware, revolving funds are funds that are typically uh, self-sustaining. So they take in revenues and they support programmatic activities. Um, the town has a number of revolving funds which are listed in the vote language. Um, we're seeking to establish two new revolving funds this year. Um, the Cutter Gallery Rentals um, with an expenditure cap of $15,000 and Community Center Rentals with an expenditure cap not to exceed $50,000. Um, the expenditure cap is a concept that uh, requires a little bit more explanation. This is just the ceiling that cannot be spent above. Um, it is set annually by the town meeting. I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, all set? Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Warden from the speaker queue. No? Uh, Ms. Crowder? Um, Ms. Mr. Loretti? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I just have a question on the... Um, called the Life Support Services Ambulance Fee. Um, it seems the uh, expenditures are considerably larger than the receipts, and I'm wondering why that is, like to the tune of about $300,000. Mr. McGee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager. Uh, the reason for that is uh, last year, actually about a year and a half ago now, there was a change in how the town accounts for ambulance revenue. 
Um, we can perform both basic life service or advanced life service. Um, typically, Armstrong Ambulance now takes all advanced life service um, ambulance rides. We take all basic life service. We used to uh, report all of our ALS, so advanced life service revenue, into the revolving fund. Um, we have a much lower revenue stream of ALS now. We have a much higher basic life service revenue stream. That goes into the general fund now. Um, so it's a, it's a change in how we record our revenue. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Potter. Okay. Seeing no more speakers in the queue, we'll go uh, straight to a vote on the main motion under Article 24. And so we'll bring up a vote. And uh, so we're, the vote here is to reauthorize revolving funds for fiscal year 2025 as specified in the select board report. So if you're in favor of reauthorizing the revolving funds, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed, two for no. And three to abstain. Voting is open. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes. The 211 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, it is unanimous. That brings us to Article 25. Uh, is, uh, Ms. Uh, Zemberry, I believe, is not here tonight, correct? And so uh, she asked me in writing uh, to allow Mr. Revelak and Mr. Benson to speak on her behalf from the Redevelopment Board uh, for some articles tonight. Mr. Revelak, you have the floor. And uh, while well, Mr. Revelak comes up, let's show the speaker queue. Uh, and can we clear it? Actually, I don't know if that was new or not. Um, no, no need to clear it if you already cleared it. Uh, Mr. Revlock, go ahead. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hello, I am Steve Revelock, a member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and I will, taking, I will be taking you through uh, Warrant Article 25 uh, building definitions. All right, uh, do we have slides for these? There should be one, uh, one PDF with all of the ARB uh, slides in it. Yeah, Andrew, don't ah, type. That, is, yeah. that it is. Don't type your password right now. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so Article 25 intends to clarify the zoning bylaw by refining the definitions of attached versus detached buildings. So this was proposed by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the current definitions of attached to detached buildings in the zoning bylaw are not internally consistent so that some buildings do not clearly fall into either category. So the revised definitions were written in consultation with the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Inspectional Services Department and are consistent with the manner in which ISD has been interpreting the zoning bylaw. So next slide. Oops for other direction. Yep, one more. Excellent. So the proposed definition of a building attached would read, a building having any portion of one or more walls or roofs in common with another adjoining building or buildings or otherwise connected by a roof to another building or buildings. So this defines attached buildings as sharing roofs or walls. So the proposed definition of building detached would read, a building that does not meet the definition of building attached. <laughs> Consistency. So the redevelopment board voted five to zero at our April 1st meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 25. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, and uh, this was initially on the consent agenda and Mr. Warden had pulled it off. So Mr. Warden, did you wanna speak? And then after Mr. Warden will take uh, Ms. Slutsky. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Uh, no, I, I, um, I, I just felt that uh, any, anything that, that relates to zoning uh, should not just be 
on the consent agenda that we don't even think about it, look at it, or we just say yes uh, with a whole bunch of other stuff. So I, 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 I felt that, it, that the <coughs> whatever, whatever it was, it should be explained to us by the, the board or the planning director or somebody uh, so that we, we would know exactly what we're voting on. Uh, this, this looks like a perfectly reasonable idea now that, it's, now that, it's, now that it has been explained. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lutsky, uh, I don't know if, she, if you took yourself. Oh, um, it's no longer on the speaker queue um, that I can see. Ms. Lutsky, did you still wish to speak or are you passing? And while we're waiting for an answer, uh, we can take uh, Mr. Rudick. I pass. Okay, pass. So Mr. Rudick, and then uh, 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 we'll take Mr. Hallman, who we haven't heard from. Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. I move to terminate debate on this article and all attached and detached. Okay. <laughs> so we have a motion. We have a motion to ter terminate debate, and uh, we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 25 say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Uh, debate is terminated. So let's go to a vote now on the main motion of Article 25. This is a two-thirds vote, uh, and this would amend Section 2 definitions in the zoning bylaws to amend the definitions of building attached and building detached. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of this change in uh, definitions uh, in the zoning bylaw, press 1 for yes. If you're opposed, Press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, just a few more seconds. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 208 in the affirmative, two in the negative, uh, and two abstentions. Uh, it takes us to Article 26. Uh, Mr. Benson, do you want to introduce this? Or Mr. Revelak. Um, Ms. Uh, hello, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, uh, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Mr. Moderator, I would make a motion to lay Article 26 on the table until Article 27 has been disposed of. OK. Um, it, it, and, and can you just clarify? Like, so the, there's, yeah. there's a piece in 26 that depends on 27. So we would like to do 27 first. OK. okay. So there's a logical dependency between the two that makes more sense if we invert the order. Correct. Correct. Right. And so and I got the same note from Ms. Zemberry in advance. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor of, uh, uh, do you want to lay it on the table or do you just want to postpone until after 27? I will, well, oh, sorry, lay it postpone. My apologies. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of postponing Article 26 until after 27, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. It is unanimous. That brings us to Article uh, 27. Mr. Thank, Revelak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am Steve Revelak, a member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and I will be taking you through Warrant Article 27 related to an administrative correction in the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Next slide, please. So this article proposes to change the, an existing list of conditions in section 592B1 from bullet points to letters to make it easier to refer to individual provisions of the zoning bylaw. This article would also delete a subsection from the bylaw that is obsolete as it references dates that have passed. This article does not make any changes to the condition or rules under which accessory dwelling units are allowed, and this amendment was proposed by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So next slide. And one more. So the amendment text, here we see the bulk of the proposed change where bullet points have been replaced with letters, making individual provisions easier to reference or cite. Next slide. And here we see the deletion of a subsection that is obsolete as the effective dates have passed. So the dates reference the addition of the accessory dwelling units to the bylaw, which were adopted by town meeting in the spring of 2021, and the six-month period referenced in item three has passed as well. The Arlington Redevelopment Board voted five to zero at our April 1st meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 27. Thank you.
Thank you. And can we switch over to the speaker queue and clear that? I uh, should have done that earlier. I think these were from before. Yeah, these are from several minutes ago. Speaker queue is now open. Um, Mr. Rudick, uh, uh, pass. Okay. So we have no more speakers. We're going to go to a vote on the main motion. Yes. Uh, all those in. Uh, actually, no, we're, we're going to do electronic vote on the main motion under Article 27. I see this. Uh, let's see. Okay. Voting is now open. If you click the button before the green light came on, you just added yourself to a speaker queue, which no longer exists. <laughs> okay, so if you're in favor of the changes that, to the zoning bylaw that Mr. Vovlak stepped us through, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed to those changes, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 212 in the affirmative, one in the negative, one person doesn't like uh, letters instead of bullet points. That takes us to Article 28. I'm sorry, 26, 26, thank you. Uh, Mr. Benson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, Eugene Benson from the Redevelopment Board. I'm going to take you through Warrant Article 26, which is just an administrative clarification to the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. Uh, this article proposes to update the references to exceptions in the requirements for district yard and open space made in section 5.4.2a by adding a reference to 5.9.2.b1. E, an exception related to allowable setbacks for accessory dwelling units. The accessory dwelling unit exception reference exists elsewhere in the bylaw. So all this does is reference that there is an exception somewhere else in the bylaw. It does not change the substance of the bylaw at all. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This just shows that we just add an additional reference to the existing code. This was um, recommended to us by the Zoning Board of Appeals for, to make it easier for them to do referencing back and forth. In their decisions, the ARB voted five to zero at our April 1 meeting to recommend favorable action on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Uh, I see no names in the speaker queue, so we'll go directly to an electronic vote on the main motion under Article 26. And so while that's coming up, we uh, will, let's see. Yeah, this, this is a vote to amend section 542A, uh, our district yard and open space requirements in the zoning bylaw to reference an exception found elsewhere in the zoning bylaw. So if you're in favor of that change that Mr. Benson described, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed to that change in the zoning bylaw, press two for no or three to abstain. This is a two thirds vote. Okay, voting is closed. And the main motion passes, 211 in the affirmative, one in the negative, and two abstentions. That takes us to Article 28, uh, Mr. Benson. And can we show the speaker queue? And, uh, okay. And then uh, back to the presentation. Mr. Benson? Uh, thank you again. Wait, hold on, we have a point of order. Uh, there is a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. We are not adjourned. Mr. Benson? <laughs> thank you so much. So uh, again, I'm Eugene Benson from the Redevelopment Board. I'll be taking you through Warrant Article 28, which refers to the deletion of the Inland Wetland Overlay District. Microphone, please, Mr. Benson. Inland, inland Wetland, sorry, Inland Wetland Overlay District for, the, um, for this. So the, 
Thank you, slides. There, there is a supplemental report that's also been filed, so we made one additional change, so you might look at both of those. And Arlington has, thank you. Arlington has an inland wetland overlay district that predates by many years the adoption of the State Wetlands Protection Act, which is implemented by the Arlington Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission has robust authority to protect wetlands and is the most appropriate body to do so as the inclusion of the Inland Wetland District in the zoning bylaw has created confusion about the appropriate body to adjudicate wetlands. Inclusion of the overlay district in the bylaw gives the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Redevelopment Board overlapping and superfluous jurisdiction better served by the Conservation Commission. This article was proposed by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the town's conservation agent is supported by the Zoning Board of Appeals, Inspectional Services Department, Department of Planning and Community Development, and the Conservation Commission. If you have not already done so, please read the memo in the annotated warrant from the Planning Director, Claire Ricker, and the town's environmental planner and conservation agent about why removing the Inland Wetland District, Overlay District, is appropriate and necessary. Next slide, next slide. All this shows is that we are deleting the reference to Inland Wetland District in the lists of overlay districts. Next slide. And then we're deleting the entire section on this. Um, I'll just speak for a couple of minutes on my own since I have a few minutes left. Um, for four years, I was the executive director of the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. We did training and advocacy for wetlands protection and open space protection. I took a really close look at this to make sure that by deleting the over overlay for the wetland district from the zoning bylaw, we would not in any way be making wetlands protection less in the town. I took a really close look at this. This used to be my job for a few years. There will be no loss of wetlands protection by removing the overlay district. We'll just get rid of a lot of confusion. Our Conservation Commission, I've noticed from the, my years working on these things, is one of the best in the state. And this town has passed its own wetland bylaws to even strengthen the state bylaws. So I can assure you that this will have no, no negative impact on wetlands protection. I also spoke to a few people in town to say, has this bylaw, zoning bylaw, ever been used to stop any sort of wetland development since the town's had, um, since the town has had a conservation commission and has um, its own wetland bylaw and it has never been used for that. Um, so I urge you to support this change, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. And uh, Ms. Revelak, you had an amendment. If, 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 am I correct that the supplemental report of the ARB that you handed in today subsumes that? Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelak, um, Precinct One Town Meeting Member, I would like to withdraw my amendment because it is subsumed by the supplemental report of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. No need to withdraw. It was not, mo it was not moved. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go to the speaker queue, and uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Hurd and then Mr. Loretti. Yeah. Mr. Loretti? And then Mr. Hallman. Thanks, Ms. Water. Chris Loretti, um, Precinct 7. Um, I actually rise in opposition to this article and the proposed change. Um, first, I think some of the information that was given to you I don't think is factually correct. The Wetlands Protection Act was passed in Massachusetts, as I understand it, in 1972. This section of the bylaw didn't apply or didn't come into effect until 1975. And it's remained in the bylaw consistently over the years, including six years ago when the, when the zoning bylaw was completely recodified. It was looked at then. It was modified, and it was left in. And if you noticed on the slides that uh, Mr. Benson, Benson showed, there's also a floodplain district in there in the zoning bylaw. That, too, is something that the, um, the Conservation Commission deals with. I don't know why they didn't propose taking that out 
when they're proposing to take out this, because the exact same arguments they're, they're making for taking out this district could have been made for that district. I suggest to you there, are, there is one very good reason for keeping this in, and it's not to necessarily to provide greater protection to the wetlands, it's to provide greater protection to the town for its permitting decisions. If this is part of a zoning bylaw, when a developer goes before the redevelopment board for a special permit, this gets effectively incorporated into that special permit. So if a developer wants to challenge um, the permit, this is, this is part of that. And I think as a matter, um, you know, if I, would, I would ask people if they can remember the last time a redevelopment board special permit has successfully been overturned in the courts. The last one that I can remember that was, even cha that was challenged at all successfully was the Sims redevelopment probably 20 years ago. Now, if you ask someone on the Conservation Commission how frequently their decisions are turned over, I, I think you'll find that it's far more frequently. I know there were some, for example, on, um, regarding developments along Spy Pond. So I would suggest uh, you know, uh, that until we're really sure that this does provide the same level of protection to the town, not only in, in the um, administration of the wetlands bylaw, but also in preserving the town's power to regulate development, I think it should stay in. The other advantage it also has is, is a lot of these developments, are, if they implicate wetlands, they're gonna be before both the redev redevelopment board and the Conservation Commission anyway. And as someone who's served on the redevelopment board, I can tell you there's never been any dissension or disagreement about how the Wetlands Protection Act should be applied. The board has always deferred to the Conservation Commission. But one thing this does, which frankly, I'm not sure the, the Conservation Commission likes, is it gets them into the process early. The Conservation Commission always takes the position that they're the last group that wants to look at a project. This is actually good in that it brings them into the process early when the, when the um, special permit granting authority, in, 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 the, in this example, the redevelopment board, is getting involved. So that if, instead of going through a, in a sequential manner, going from the redevelopment board back to the Conservation Commission, which then may require changes that require the project to go back to the redevelopment board, this allows it all to be handled all at once. So I think, there, I see some distinct advantages to keeping it in. My suggestion um, for the reason you're hearing so much about taking it out now is simply there's been quite a bit of staff turnover over the years and there hasn't been that institutional experience in understanding how the um, boards and commission work together to make this work effectively. So I'll be voting no on this, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hallman and then Mr. Lewicki. Aram Holman, Precinct 6. Um, I appreciate what Mr. Benson said about uh, making sure that no protections will be diminished. Uh, in many ways, I like this proposal. I am concerned about something on it, and I'm wondering if I could ask a question of either Mr. Benson or somebody else qualified to answer. Of course, your question. Okay, um, in what is being proposed uh, to eliminate the Inland Wetland District. Uh, there's words to the effect that uh, land along perennial rivers, brooks, etc., are protected for a horizontal distance of 200 feet from the center line. Uh, is, there any, uh, is there any flexibility in that 200 feet? Uh, Mr. Benson or Mr. Revelak? Uh, okay, uh, to the microphone, please. In what is proposed to be eliminated, is there any flexibility in that 200 foot distance? Well, we're proposing to eliminate it. The town wetland bylaw retains the 200 foot um, distance. So that's where one would look um, if there was any question. I, I understand that that's what you're proposing to eliminate. But when I look in the section of Article 8 wetlands protection, uh, I just want to quote from that. Uh, the commission there may require that the applicant main, maintain a strip of continuous, undisturbed vegetative cover within the 200-foot riverfront area. So is that the same 200 feet? Yes. Okay. The difference that I notice is one particular word, 
and I want to emphasize it. The commission, that is, the Conservation Commission, therefore may, emphasis, may require that the applicant maintain such a strip. And I'm reading that to mean it is at the discretion of the commission whether or not to do that within 200 feet. Now, I understand that the state law requires 100 feet of protection no matter what. Arlington, in its wisdom, in both of these provisions for the ARB and, excuse me, the Zoning Board of Appeals and for the Conservation Commission, extended that to 200 feet. The difference is that in the new wording that you are proposing, there is an element of discretion in enforcing that. I do not see that element of discretion in what is being proposed to eliminate. Am I correct in interpreting that? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Holman, because to my knowledge, uh, the ARB has never implemented this and the Zoning Board of Appeals has never implemented it because it's so confusing about how to do it. Both boards have generally deferred to the Conservation Commission. During my seven years on the Redevelopment Board, it has never come up. I, I understand that, but at the same time, you said you had taken great care to make sure that there would be no diminishment of any conservation protections. And as I'm reading it, I am seeing in what you're proposing to delete an absolute requirement for 200 feet, whereas in the new wording, I'm seeing a discretionary requirement of 200 feet. And I guess I'm interpreting that as exactly the kind of diminishment that concerns me. I, I can't give you a definitive answer without reading the Conservation Commission bylaw. I, I can just again tell you that it has never come up at the Redevelopment Board or to my knowledge in speaking with the Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals with the Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. Um, I, so, so we, I have, we have a difference in interpretation. It's, a, it's, yeah. a ma it's a matter of interpretation. At this point, I'm not fully convinced that there will be no diminishment of conservation protection. And I think by switching from one jurisdiction, by one regulating board to another, you are giving the Conservation Commission the discretion to enforce this for 200 feet, whereas in the, uh, what exists, in what should be deleted, in what is proposed to be deleted now, that discretion is not there. So at this point, I think until that discrepancy can be resolved, I would urge you to vote against this uh, one possibility, and I realize we are not amending the Conservation Commission uh, regulations right now, would be to change the Conservation Commission uh, regulations to eliminate that word may and put in the word shall. And therefore, we would have the definitive, unconditional, unambiguous 200-foot protection that is in the uh, regulations proposed to be eliminated. So I will be voting no on this and urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holman's speaking time is up, so uh, we're going to move on. Uh, Mr. Lewicki and then Mr. Jaspin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jay Lewicki, Precinct 2. I move to terminate debate. Okay. okay, we have a motion to terminate debate, and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating the debate under Article 28 say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Debate is not terminated. Um, okay. Well, we're in the middle of a vote here, so the vote is challenged, and we'll do an electronic vote uh, on termination of debate. So when the green light is on, it is now on. Vote one if you want to terminate debate under Article 28, and vote two. Um, uh, for no to continue debate, and three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting.
And debate is terminated. 152 in the affirmative, 57 in the negative. And is that, is that, is that two thirds? Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll now move to a vote on the main motion under Article 28. Uh, voting is not. Voting is now open. So, vote. This is a sorry. This is a two-thirds vote to uh, delete section 5.8 inland wetland overlay district and a reference to it uh, from the zoning bylaw. If you're in favor of that change, uh, vote one for yes. If you're against that change, you're opposed. Vote two for no and three to abstain. Okay. Let's close voting. And this is a two-thirds vote. And it fails. 135 in the affirmative, 78 in the negative. That brings us to Article 29. We have a motion to adjourn, and we have a second. All those in favor, well, before we take that, any, any notices of reconsideration for tonight? Ms. Deschler? Uh, point of order? No, pass? Okay. Uh, 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 Ms. Deschler? Uh, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Having voted on the prevailing side, I give, I give notice of reconsideration on Article 45. On 45. Noted. Okay, and we had a motion to adjourn and a second. So all those in favor of adjourning say yes. Yes! All those opposed say no. no. We are adjourned until Monday, which is budget night. <laughs> ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.